Thank you for being with me today. Today we're going to look at the very first doctrine of traditional Chinese medicine, the Taoist medicine doctrine. Ironically, it's not the medical classics doctrine would be considered to be the first doctrine. Actually, Taoist medicine doctrine is the first. In some ways, this relates to a lot to do with survival. You know, we study history so that we can appreciate and understand the past, so that we can apply what we learn from the past to the present, and hopefully would help us to envision the future so we don't make mistakes from the past. Taoist medicine actually started on the premise, the premise of learning about disease, about health, about how survival was very important at the very beginning. In the old days, in any culture, almost all ancient cultures in this world that we know on earth starts as tribal culture. This is no different in the ancient China, around the Yellow River area, where the tribal culture is very steeply ingrained in people's life more than five, six thousand years ago. During that time, it was very important to observe nature, very important to understand and to hunt for games and eventually learn to plant and domesticate lives, um, herds that can be held for survival. So it was all about survival. And that survival really sharpens our instincts. That survival helps us to really become in tuned with our environment to a great detail. We are able to figure things out even though at that time we don't know why. So frequently, we chuck that up to the work of God, to the work of a universal spirit, ghost, or whatever it might be. And that is the origination of medicine. So to understand Taoist medicine, we need to understand what is Taoism. Well, it's a very important branch in Chinese philosophy, along with Confucianism. Uh, it's a relig religion as well. It's also a spiritual practices. And it's based on the foundation of Tao. And it means the way. And it frequently refers to the way of how the universe works. And refers to the way how the earth is formed, created, and how lives are formed and created. Its essence, it's about trying to find a unifying principle of everything around us. There must be an underlying principle that explains everything that we touch, that we see, and that we come in contact with. We call this, in Taoism, the universal truth. Taoist medicine is that important branch of TCM that underneath, the, underneath of it, having that the way, the concept of the way. It's an important field of study for Taoist physicians. In the old days, Taoism is a blending <clears throat> of religion and science. And religion obviously has a lot to do with faith and beliefs. The main focus of Taoism is about universal truth, benevolence, balance, and then not the least, how long can I live? And how well can I live? And how much disease can I prevent? These are some of the fundamental principles of survival. And as we learn how to survive better, later on we learn how to thrive well. So from survival to thriving, Taoism is a big part integrated study of TCM. So this includes the study of mysticism, religion, philosophy, science, and medicine. And the main concept 
is to learn to live with heaven and earth. Learn to understand and live together with the energetics of heaven and earth so that we can live as long as heaven and earth. And that we understand how the world works. So we don't violate the principles of heaven and earth because when we violate those principles, we get sick. We get in and young imbalance. So that's Taoist that medicine. So some people ask, what is the difference from a regular TCM doctor versus a Taoist TCM doctor? Well, we know TCM doctor, very good in focusing on diagnosis, treatment, and even prevention of diseases. It believes in long life, but it doesn't necessarily believe in immortality. It does not believe in ghosts or spiritual phenomenon. It does not believe in astrological influences, though we do believe in five elemental principles. And it does not always believe in the concept of feng shui. While the Taoist TCM doctor, just like a TCM doctor, focus on diagnosis, treatment, but serious student of preventing illnesses from happening into the future. So it puts a lot of focus on how you can nourish life and how you can really have a strong prevention of future illnesses. It focuses on longevity and it believes immortality is possible. So it very much pinpoint focus, strong focus on how to live longer. So in the sense is that we would say that Taoist medicine is really a big part of that medicine that deal with geriatrics, that deal with how to live healthy for a long period of time. Taoist medicine also believe in environmental influences. It believe in ecology. It believes the environment that surrounds us, whether we create it or is there at the first place, affects us. The environment where and when we were born affects us. The planets, the stars, the moons that lines up in a certain way, the kind of alignment that it has, the astrological influences, the energy that it shines on earth during that period when we were born, determines our personality, determines in some ways our chi. So Taoist medicine believes in environmental influences. And that might be a little esoteric but maybe less esoteric is the environment you live in. If you live in a damp environment, you're going to get sick very easily. You live in a hot environment, you're going to get sick easily. So in some ways, there is a, a lot of truth to looking at feng shui, looking at how to prevent from wind blowing directly at you, uh, how to look at there is clean water someplace, and how the water runs through your house and your relationship on, on the direction of sun night and, and moon night and all that is taken into consideration of feng shui. The Taoist TCM doctor also believe in the phenomenon of ghosts and spirit, believes that when our physical body moves onward and forward, that our spirit is frequently still there or that the spirit exists and that we need to not just appreciate our physical being, but we need to appreciate and be respectful to every individual spirit. And that's the Taoist medicine concept. He also believe in astrological influences, like what I just said earlier. Astrological influences can shape a certain distinct personality and shape a distinct uh, life trend uh, throughout the entire life. So quite a bit of difference between Taoist medicine. And sometimes you could say some of these are basically a faith-based belief system. It is true, some is, but some is actually not. Taoist medicine, Taoist physicians are very scientific. They do actually question um, and they are skeptical with certain things, not always a blind belief. So let's move forward to look at uh, some of the things that we could explore together. Number one, all medicines, and doesn't matter where in the world, 
begins as a religious medicine, because in the beginning we believe that there is a higher power. And sometimes the reason we believe in a higher power is because we don't always understand what's going on. Somebody gets sick with a fever. This is the way of the gods. Somebody is、uh, sick with some kind of infection. That's the way of gods. That's a punishment.、Um, sometimes there's a difficult labor. That's the way of gods. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world. All medicine in the world begins as a religious medicine, and at the same time, all the students of Tao, the people who are interested to know the universal truth, to really try to understand the underlying principle we call this God, they always begin their study by studying medicine, because at the very beginning, that's what you want to do. You want to survive. You want to get rid of sickness because in the old day when we don't have much medicine, a simple sickness like a cold and flu, especially flu, can kill you. So it was very important to study and be able to come back and be able to conquer some of these illnesses. So all students that study with Taoism to understand the underlying principle always begin their study by studying medicine. Now. There is a fundamentally a very strong intertwined relationship between traditional Chinese medicine and Taoist medicine, but in some ways also separate. One deal with religion and healing, and、uh, and there is the immortality belief in Taoism that doesn't really translate that much into TCM. Now this is mutually absorbing and promoting because in the old days. Taoist medicine is more of a religious medicine, as I said earlier. That's how the world started. So there's a lot of preaching, there's a lot of religious spreading, a missionary style kind of spreading. So, and the way a Taoist physician can spread the concept of Taoist religion at that time was to actually help healing. If I can help you to heal, people will believe more in the Taoist concept. And on the other side of the coin, the TCM, where people don't really want to be religious or trying to be skeptical and get away from that, they also borrow the understanding of immortality and some of the techniques that the Taoist medicine can provide into the TCM uh, 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 paradigm. So let's take a look at some of the characteristics of Taoist medicine. Again, in the old days when Taoism was a religion. He uses medicine as a missionary purpose, and he emphasizes the importance on life and deeds. Two things: one, treasure your life. Taoists believe that when you're given a privilege of a life, regardless whether that is a perfect life or handicap or imperfect life, that is not important. What's important is that you treasure what you have been given. Because you're blessed by it, regardless what that form might be. That's number one. Number two is deeds. Deeds. It's about what you bring to the world. Heaven and earth gave you this existence of soul and body. What are you gonna do about it? That's the deeds. That's your behaviors. That's what you do. This may be. Things that you do in the world, maybe the productivity you apply onto the world by healing, by helping people, by behaving、uh, helpfully to other human beings. That's the deeds. So the Taoists really believe strongly in not just studying the universal truth, but at the same time act, behave, and implement. The universal truth through what we do as a human being. It believes in self-healing and cultivation and social services. It look at science and it also look at mysticism. It believes in science and at the same time believe that there are plenty of things that we still don't understand. And when there are things that we don't understand, it's important not to taboo it. It's important not to push it away, but it's important to say. 
This is something we don't understand. Instead of saying that this is the will of God's, the Taoists say this is the will of heaven and earth. This is the universal truth that we're trying to discover and trying to understand. So, the characteristics of Taoist medicine is really an amalgamation of physical healing, psychological healing, sociological healing, public health, and faith healing. Uh, so there's a lot of entanglement of a lot of these characteristics. There are two major focuses for the Taoists. One is Gong, as I said earlier. Gong has a lot to do with self-cultivation. It's about what you can do to treasure your life. And part of treasuring your life is not about just not abuse or, or create harm to your body. But it also asks you to see what you can do to cultivate your body, to make your body to achieve its maximum potential. That is gong. And the other one is xin. Xin means behaviors, actions, and deeds to benefit the community around you, to benefit your neighbors, to benefit your family, to benefit your society. When you have enough, and even when you don't have enough, you're trying to find ways to help others because your existence of being here is blessed. So you must fundamentally give back to the world that created you. So these are the two major focuses for the Taoists. So what did Taoist medicine contribute to TCM? What has Taoist medicine contributed? A lot. Tremendous. One is formulations. There's a lot of Formulation, whether it's herbal or whether it's meditative, that is an exercise such as qigong and meditation that has been formed, that has been created to slow down the aging process. That's a huge contribution to geriatric medicine. That's a huge contribution to understanding of medicine itself. Second, initiation of chemistry. I think the very first chemist it's our ancient people in the tribes. That's where they come across different natural occurring chemicals and they use it for different purposes, whether it's creating paints, creating dye, uh, whether it's um, actually cinnabar. This is a Chinese herbal medicine that is basically mercury sulfide, which is used a lot for calming the spirit, for anxiety. For example, nowadays we know it's quite toxic, so we don't use it anymore. But nevertheless, it is an initiation of chemistry. Sir, is that there a specific dietary understanding that comes about? For example, you got to cook your meals. I mean, this is something we already know. And the existence of fire really helps to kill germs and cook our meals, cook our meats, that actually help us not to get sick from them. So that's important. But that's not the only thing. We're talking about specific dietary understanding about how the grains can nourish our spleen and stomach, how the meats can go to different zanghu and build our blood, build our tendons, build our bones, for example. These are some of the very beginning, but also very sophisticated dietary understanding in Taoist medicine. Number four, spiritual healing. Uh, the use of invocations, the use of talisman, and this all spiritual healing is also the beginning of psychological healing. Okay, it's a big part of mental psychological healing, and that's a contribution in Taoist medicine. Number five, sexual healing. There's a whole book, there's a whole area on how sex, sexual activity, can actually be a healing activity, as well as can be a harmful activity. All really depends how you go about it. Okay, so that's also the contribution from the Taoist medicine. And then not the least, the understanding of sanitation, the understanding of preventive medicine is very strong that integrates throughout all the Taoist healing, uh, Taoist medicine uh, contributions. So if we look at in the old days, in the historical transformation between death and diseases, you know, in the old days, these doctors so-called doctor are what we call medicine men. Oh, in the West, we call them medicine men, and sometimes we call them witches. In China, we call them basically medicine men, and we call them witches as well, like everybody else does in the ancient times. 
Um, but on top of it, with the Taoist understanding, <clears throat> there's also what we call immortality guides. These are doctors that help you to achieve immortality. Um, and also they are then the doctors that treat the disease later on. So there's a transformation. First is witches, medicine men, then is the immortality guide, uh, then is the doctors for the treatment of diseases. Um, and that's a transformation in China. Now witches, medicine men really teach you and actually help you in praying, uh, perform invocations, perform objectifications, predictions, touch, and even a little drama that help you to heal. We call that the medicine men. And then the contributions are great. These early time um, medicine men, Sen Nong might be a medicine man. Sen Nong is the one that you know that tastes 360 uh, herbs. I mean, came out with Sen Nong Ben Cao Jing. I don't think he wrote that book, really. I mean, I mean in China, you just put Sen Nong on there. Everybody would read a book. It becomes just a very, very good book. But Sen Nong is known to have taste a hundred toxins a day because he was so into herbal medicine and he tested himself with his own body to make sure that's not toxic. So when he found something toxic, then he doesn't use it on, on his uh, patients. Um, so great contribution from these medicine men. Uh, the contribution of herbology, contribution about how to use herbal substances and techniques, for example, to get rid of infections and fever. Uh, some of these can be very rude, men, rudimentary, such as bleeding uh, to, to get rid of fever. Um, and it's really old. I don't think anybody does it anymore. Uh, but at least it's a starting point in, uh, on how to treat uh, illnesses. Some of the other contribution is spiritual healing and psycho, psycho, uh, psychological counseling, for example. And they do chants. Uh, they do invocations and those are kind of things. So um, uh, in the next slide, I have actually show you some of the sample of the Taoist talisman. Um, these are the talisman that you will see above a door um, that's uh, in certain rooms and this talisman has significance. Uh, we put a lot of energy and prayers onto this talisman and this talisman, talisman do a certain type of function. Some is to protect the spirit in the room. Some is to uh, protect the health of uh, this family, etc. So there's different purpose of talisman, but that's one of the ways of a spiritual healing. Then as we transform from the witch doctor to Feng Si. Feng Si is um, actually started around the time of uh, Qin Dynasty. And this is where that Qin Si Wang uh, the guy who actually unified China at that time, he became the most powerful emperor on earth. So when you become powerful, you have everything. What do you wish for next thing? Obviously, the next best thing is not Nintendo games. The best next thing is, can I live forever? So I can drink all the alcohol I want, so I can bed with all the women that I want. I mean, that's what the emperor was in the old days. So that's what his thought is, I want to live forever. So at that time, as you know, when you have a demand, when you have a need, then supply for whatever reason comes up from somewhere. So this created a whole phenomenon of the immortality guides. It's, a, it's like travel guide. You know, when you go travel to a country, you have a travel guide. Well, there are guides that teach you and guides you to immortality. So. And they are really into heavy metals at that time. They would cook some heavy metals, and you would take them. And obviously, you're euphoric. I mean, you would start to see things. You're seeing color. You're seeing, uh, you know, you're seeing things that you've never seen before. So when you come about, and if you're lucky to be alive, come around, and you say, oh, my God, this is cool. I see another world. This is great. I'm living forever. Okay. So that's the immortality medicine. Obviously, this is uh, ridiculous. Um, but there's always the negative, but there's always the positive. The contribution of Feng Si, of the immortality guys, is that they actually pass down some of the exercise that actually is very helpful. 
such as Qigong, we call it in the old day called Dao Yin. Dao Yin Qigong, chemistry, concept of detoxification, fasting. Okay, that's very helpful. And there's certain dietary understandings. Now, the dietary understanding in the old days, uh, so interestingly, we try to revert back every few years, every couple of years in the modern world. Um, the dietary understanding from the ancient time always been back to nature, eat more vegetables, less quantity, more fluid. In fact, sometimes you don't need as much food. Sometimes you don't need as much grain. Sometimes you do a no-grain fast. This is almost like the gluten-free diet, for example. Reduce fat and protein. So in the old day already, the Taoists believe in not going excessive, having a balanced lifestyle and balanced diet. So that dietary understanding is thousands of years old, and to this day, it still works. In Taoist medicine, it talks about the three demons, or we call the three wounds. There's the upper demon, there's the middle demon, and there's the lower demon. And the upper demon is the greed for materials, greeding to conquer, greed for wanting everything to possess. It's a sense of power. It's a sense of acquiring material goods. Okay? It's normal for us to want to have possessions. It's normal. But when it becomes demonic is when you want too much of it. When it becomes imbalanced, you become obsessive of it. Number two is the middle demon. Ah, middle demon is the grief for food. Okay. Um, normally, you're hungry, you want to eat. That's a normal phenomenon. But there are many times where that after you eat, you still want to eat because that tiramisu looks really good. Now, that is what we call wanting. It's no longer needs anymore. You're wanting something, and that it becomes greed. Eventually, when you're greedy enough, your tummy gets more bloated, you start to gain weight. And eventually, your body can't handle it. You'll give up. Okay? So that is the greed for food. The third greed, or demon, <clears throat> is the greed for sex, down law. The greed for sex, in some sense, is uh, pleasure. You know, humans are pleasure-seeking animal. All right? Pleasure-seeking animal. But if you're always seeking pleasure at all times, 24-7, eventually what's going to happen is that your body will become sick. You'll become depleted. All the energy will be consumed then you're no longer doing things that might be productive to helping other human beings, for example. Okay, So that is, in some ways, counter of purpose of what a Taoist would like to do. So it's great to have sex, but it's got to be a balance. So that's the lower demon. So those are the three demons. The upper demon, the middle demon, and lower demon. Upper demon for materials, middle demon for food, and then the lower demon for sex. So the Taoists believe when we have less greed, we have better health. When we have better health, we would have better life. We have better life, we will have better world. Okay, in some ways, uh, greed creates problems. Now let's take a look at some of the influential doctors. There are many TCM doctors who are Taoist physicians, starting from Dong Feng all the way down to Zhao Yizhen. There are many of them. Ge Hong, for example, was a very important doctor. Bao Gu, uh, Tao Hong Jin, uh, Yang San Sen. Some of these uh, doctors actually have translated or elaborated on Xiang Han Wenbin, have given tremendous amount of contribution to TCM. Wan Bing, for example. Uh, and Sun Simiao, everybody knows the king of uh, Chinese uh, herbal medicine. Uh, Chinese medicine is Sun Simiao, who had taught us a lot about ethics, taught us a lot about preventional illness, sanitations, taught us a lot about formularies, uh, especially through his thousand gold formulas we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, Wang Huayin, uh, Ma Zi, uh, Cui uh, Jian Yan, and Liu Wansu, which is a major initiator of a doctrine in the Jinyuan dynasty. So, 
quite a bit of people, and we're not going to be able to go through the stories of each one of them, but I'm just going to take two people uh, to really look at because they are amazing uh, doctor. One is Ge Hong, and the other one is uh, Sun Si Miao. So uh, let's first uh, look at uh, some of the influential publications overall. You will see uh, Ge Hong had written Bao Pu Zi Nei Pian, Zhou uh, Hou Bei Ji Fang, which is also a formulary book. And then while Sun Simiao has written out Qian Jing Yao Huang, Qian Jing Yi Huang, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, a little bit later. And not the least, Dao Zhang, Daoist Canon. It's a huge collection of all the Daoist texts. Uh, in, my, in my office, I actually have a bookshelf that actually is a Taoist canon, and it goes from the top to the bottom <coughs> and fills up the whole shelf. And if you are at Yosan University, on the second, second floor, you will see a copy of the Taoist canon in the uh, cabinet that you can see. It originally published in 417 AD, and there are many iterations many additions and modifications later on throughout the centuries. And the last compilation is in 1997. Uh, and it's a collection that included over 1,500 volumes of different publications of Taoism. It's an enormous compilation and collection. Uh, it's a wonderful resource for any Taoist physician to study. It's enough enough books for them to study for a few lifetime over. So that is uh, some of the influential publications. So let's go to the first Taoist doctor I want to spend some time with is Ge Hong. Ge Hong is uh, born in 283 AD and passed away in 364 AD. Um, one thing that he has contributed greatly is he is what we call the, a people's doctor. He goes to the countryside, he go to farmers and uh, people who are very poor, and then he try to help them. And the way he helped them is to come up with very effective, cheap, and convenient, easily accessible herbs and formulas for the people in the countryside, for the working people. And he is also known to be the initiator of chemistry in the world. Um, and he is, funny thing as a Taoist doctor, he was actually totally against witch doctors. He does not believe in witch doctors. He believed that the witch doctors are basically hypes. You know, it's not true. It's not scientific enough. He doesn't use the word scientific, but he believes it's a wrong, it's a wrong Taoist medicine. So he is very much spoken out against um, uh, doctors, uh, especially the witch doctors. He's the first one in the world that identified tuberculosis, smallpox, jaundice, and hepatitis. He had a very clear description of these four diseases in their symptomology and in their signs. He has written 60-plus publications ranging from medicine, cultivation, spiritual enlightenment, astrology, astronomy, art of war, etc. Many, many of them. Unfortunately, most of them are lost. So some of them that he's able to pass down is really only a few, and most of them is in medicine. Now, Ge Hong is a very much of a paradoxical thinker. While he is against witches, while he is against medical quackery, he believes in physical immortality. He believes that the body can live forever. Now, come to think about it, that might actually just be the truth if we figure out the genomic medicine. If we have the right DNA information, we might be able to grow a tissue that can actually last forever. So he might not be far away from it in thinking in that train of thought. He does believe the existence of spirit and the ability for human to achieve immortal spiritual status. Okay. And he also believed that as we are in the light, in the physical being, we are binded in this physical realm. And this is called the binding of the life and death. And as a Taoist, we must cultivate beyond that. We must become light and get out of that physical space, but go into a spiritual realm. 
He also believed that religion is like what Karl Marx say, that religion is the opium of people. At times, religion creates wars. It creates falsified realities. It numbs the people. It motivates people to kill each other. It creates conflicts. So he hates religion in his guts. He believes that religion, there are some good stuff. There are some spiritual things that we should learn. But when it's out of balance, it becomes toxic. It's a toxin. So in one of his books, Ba Pu Zi Nei Pian, which is actually quite difficult for even for any Taoist medicine modern day try to study it, because the language is written very much in the old language. It's 20 chapters, and it ranges from mysticism, the Tao, enlightenment medicine, nature's law, philosophy of life, difficulties, how to handle difficulties, universal subtleties, diligent search, identifying the truth, facing uncertainty. It goes anyway from philosophy to medicine. But at least it's a very important historical document that describes Taoism before 200 AD. Now his more medicine book is called Behind Elbow Prepare Acute Formulary. It basically means this is all the formula you really need just right behind your elbow so that you can pull it out and use it for the people. So it's basically what we call common accessible formularies, uh, commonly known as Zhou Hou Bei Ji Fang. Eight sections divided into 73 chapters. In this book, there's about 1,060 formulas. 714 of them is for internal conditions. 346 of them is for external conditions. Again, these formulas are cheap, accessible, simple to formulate, and truly effective, even some of them today. For example, the white radish seed. The white radish is daikon, daikon radish. The seed can be used for chronic cough. We call it life foods chronic cough, for asthma, with thick sputum and even pussy blood. And that is still true today, that we use the, uh, the seed for that condition. Other things such as bamboo shaving can be used for children's asthma, cough, and sinus congestion. And that is still used quite a bit today. In fact, some of the cough syrup have some of these uh, concentrate of this bamboo shaving for that kind of condition. Um, so uh, this is a wonderful medicine book. And let's go back to Bao Pu Zi Nei Pian, not Nei Pian. So in Bao Pu Zi Nei Pian, there are a few concepts I want to share with you. The first concept is that qi is the source of all lives. So this is kind of around the Huang Di Nei Jin time, and this further fortifies the concept that the qi is a very important concept in TCM. And he believed that for any life to exist, there must be a tangible and an intangible. The tangible is the form. The intangible is the spirit, or sometimes we call the visible and invisible, okay? And there is that requirement for life to exist. You must have this coexistence of both, okay? And that both have to be balanced. If we overstrain our body, we can cause the scattering of our spirit. If we exhaust our spirit, we will exhaust our body. And the final consumption of qi is the ending of life. Okay. The other concept is the changes of matter. Since he is a chemist, since he is a scientist, he believes change by man can actually replace nature. We can make clouds. He believes we can make rain. We can make frost. We can make lightning. We can even make snow. Well, it's really true. We are making snow in ski resorts. All right? We are in China. They are making more rain by dumping some silver nitrate, I believe, or some silver particles into the cloud layer so you can enhance the rain. So it's interesting at that time here is that understanding and concept that we can change nature. And because of that, we need to be careful what we do with nature. 
as much as we want to change nature, we also don't want to violate the nature's principle. Okay, so we want to do this more of a temporary measure, not necessarily a long-term measure. And he believed that organic matters can be formed from inorganic matters. And um, so Bao Puzi's 那篇 also discuss about chemistry. It、uh, list、uh, discovery and identification of about twenty-two or more minerals and compounds ranging from lead, sulfur, calcium, mercury, silicon, to metals and bronze. And it talk about even give you a formula how to make the basic cinnabar mercury sulfide. And this, and also making of ferric sulfide,、uh, copper sulfide, cupric sulfide, lead sulfide,、um, carbon disulfide, and this is the beginning of what we call the smelting process. Okay, and that's probably the most, the oldest smelting process you'll ever see,、uh, and especially in the Chinese culture. In the Bao Puzi 那那篇 it also describe tide. The phenomenon of tide. He also described the spiral force of helicopter being able to fly.、Uh, the gears. He described the gears because if you remember, in Huangdi time, the Chinese have actually developed a compass. The compass always can, you know, turn and always can point to true north. Okay, so it figure out all the gears, and so in some ways. Science is really robust during this period of time, and he also given us、um, the understanding that sick people blame on wind coal and summer damp, but wind coal summer heat cannot injure the strong one. Only when your body is weak and the qi is deficient, then you get sick. This is probably the very first statement that deal with the importance. Of your immune system, okay. So this is quite old, okay. This is quite old of a thought. The next doctor I want to share with you is Sun Simiao. Sun Simiao is what we call the King of Medicine, and he was born in 581 A.D. and he passed away 682 A.D. Lived to known about 101 years old. Considered to be a genius. He studied hard since seven years old. Great, great memory. Passed many exams to become a scholar with great depth and breadth of knowledge in so many areas, including philosophy, medicine, and he actually even refused three emperors' invitation to become a high-level court official.、Uh, but he rather he went and become the barefoot doctor to serve the working public. This is distinct Taoist medicine concept. Is to share your knowledge with the most poorest people, poorest population. He has helped thousands, and temples were built, even today, and still exist today, to commemorate his contribution to the community, to the medicine, and so he is now known to be the king of medicine. And、uh, in the slide, I actually have shown some pictures of some of his temples. Now. He has two seminal works. One is Bei Ji Qian Jin Yao Wang, and the other one is the supplement to that book. And this book is translated as the essential formulas for emergencies. That's worth a thousand pieces of gold.、Uh, basically, these are wonderful formulary books. So, if we say that the medical classics, such as Jing Gui Yao Lue and Sang Han Ru, given us a very nice fundamental few hundred formulas. While Sun Simiao expanded it, he collected. He is the first one that collected so many formulas. This man tax lists about forty five hundred herbal formulas. The enormity is amazing, and the supplement another two thousand. Add these both together, you're talking about sixty five hundred formula collection. This is the biggest collection of formulas since the classics. It's a milestone. And it summarizes really what happened in the pre-Tang Dynasty medicine in China. And he talk about how there are other, I mean, 
besides an, as an herbal book, it's not really just an herbal book. It's really kind of like the therapeutic book. And he actually talked about the 13 measures to keep good health, which is he claims the action of touching hair, rolling eyes, walking, shaking head, uh, doing some of these actually warm-up exercises we do at Yosan University that we shake and we uh, you know, touch our body and we massage our body and he really lay a very strong foundation on Qigong practices. Okay, So it's a milestone not only in herbal medicine but also in the understanding of prevention of illnesses. And not the least, he really is the one that actually gave us the Chinese Hippocratic Oath. From the first chapter of main tax, he says, a great physician should not pay attention to status, wealth, or age. Neither should he question whether the particular person is attractive or unattractive, whether he is the enemy or friend, whether he is uneducated or educated. He should meet everyone on equal grounds. He should always act as he were thinking of his close relatives. Hard to do, but that's what he requires his students. That's what he believes that all the Taoist medicine physicians or the TCM physicians must adhere to. Very high standard, and that created the first Hippocratic Oath of TCM. Now, he given us five major contributions if you look through his works. One, he emphasized on ethics, as we just talked about, and cultivation of character, not just the body, but the character. And he has, and he actually elaborated on a new understanding, uh, new understanding of uh, Xiang Han Ren. And the third, he expanded on the whole area of miscellaneous disease. Well, as we know, in the old days, we got really two types. Either you have infectious disease or you have non-infectious disease. So the infectious disease was classified under Xiang Han. Non-infectious disease is classified under Jing Gui. So he expanded that part to a huge way, where because later on, not every disease is caused by infection. So he spent a lot of time collecting formulas and expanded on the theories and understanding of miscellaneous diseases. And his fourth contribution is, is his collection of these herbal formulas. I mean, 6,400 herbal formulas, huge, enormous. He provided such a treasure trove to all the doctors later being able to use the formulas on a condition that they may know, not know what to do with. He was able to provide that. And not the least, that he emphasized on prevention and the whole concept of yang sen. Yang sen, literal translation means nourishing life. Okay, treasuring life, nourishing life, live to your potential, prevent illnesses, and strengthen your body so you can live long. Uh, that whole concept is something that he believed in. Even this is a time where there's still a lot of diseases, but he believed besides disease, we had to look at that. In ethics and character cultivation, he believed that patient's care is important, that we must follow the physician's oath, we must calm spirit, we must anchor subjectivity, we must be objective, we must be compassionate, give equal treatment to all our patients. With our colleagues, we should never boast ourselves and never damage other people's reputations. And not at least always learn from other people. There's always something you can learn from others. And in your work behavior, you must be cautious, careful, but decisive. You must be flexible, but focused. You must have deep thoughts, but the thoughts must be also broad. Sun Si Miao once said that when I studied TCM for three years, I realized I have formulas for every disease when I'm a student. But when I really start seeing patients for three years, I realize I have no perfect formula for each disease. Uh, so he is wonderful in the sense that he's telling us that disease can be complicated and we must always be cautious and we must always spend time to study and really uh, deepen ourselves 
so we can have a better understanding of what we can do to help our patients more. The second contribution is a contribution to Shang Han Run. His contribution, he revitalized the Shang Han Run. It's a big deal because later on, you know, some of this time, in that time, Shang Han Run was lost. And when he comes back, it was very difficult to read, too difficult. There's some lost uh, chapters. So he was able to put them together, pull together, and he actually translated and focused on three main categories of formulas. Gui Zi Tang, Ma Fang Tang, and Qin Long Tang, which really helps uh, the later physician to study. Um, the other contribution is to miscellaneous diseases. He began to categorize disease into classification of five zhang and six fu organ differentiation. This is when he established the foundation for the zhang hu differentiation school for the doctrine of Yi Sui doctrine later. So we'll talk about that later. He also elaborated uh, discussion on cholera, uh, jaundice, uh, shalko, which is diabetes, Lin syndrome, which is uh, urinary tract infections and kidney problems, edema, emphysema, stroke, and chronic fatigue conditions. And his contribution to collecting formula is great. As I say again, his book, 4500 Formula, plus 2000 in the supplement book, mostly his own clinical experience. Also, he talked about the importance of combining food and herb together. For example, lamb soup, what we call the lamb du zong soup, for the treatment of postpartum back pain. So you would take a lamb and you would cook with du zong, uh, zi yuan, uh, wu wei zi, xi xin, uh, Dang, uh, 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 Dong Hua, uh, Ren Sen, uh, Ho Pu, uh, Chuan Xiong Fu Zi, some of these herbs when you combine together to use for deficiency after labor, for cold damp B attack and lower back pain and wind attack, uh, also lung problem with asthma and cough. So he talks about how you know this, when you combine the food and the herb together, can give a very unique strategic effect, a synergistic effect. He also created some new formula that was very useful even to today, uh, such as Du Huo Ji Sen Tang. This is Du Huo Ji Sen Tang, as you know, is commonly used for kidney deficiency, uh, back pain. Um, this uh, formula has Du Huo, San Ji Sen, Du uh, Zhong, uh, Niu Xi, Xi Xin, Qin Jiao, and Fu Ling, Ruo Gui, um, and uh, Chuan Xiong, Sen Di, Ren Sen, Gan Cao, Dang Gui, Bai Sao. Um, and this is a very frequently used B syndrome uh, formulation. He also emphasized on prevention and Yang Sen. In Yang Sen, he believed in a cultivation of character. We need to learn how to calm our emotion and learn to be positive. There are 10 essential areas of cultivation you talk about. Controlling your spirit, controlling your chi, balance your body, Taoing, understanding your conversations, your food and drink, look at balance in your food and drink, sex, customs, medicine, understand your contradictions, understand your country indications and look at forbidden items, whether or not they make sense. He also talked about 12 less, less thinking, less scheming, less desiring, less conflicting, less excitation, less talking, less worrying, less happy, less joy, less anger, less good, less bad, and your life is going to be peaceful. So in some way, you talk about a balance of emotions, and that's actually very important for mental health. So he already started at that time on teaching the later doctors on how to have that balance. He believed very strongly of regular exercise, self-massage, and the five animal Tao in exercise later on as part of the Qigong. He also believed in 
strongly nutritional healing. Less meat, less fats, more cooked vegetables. Actually, you talk about avoiding raw vegetables, raw rice, spoiled foods, alcohol. Avoid binging. He encourages less food and more meals. Eat only when you're hungry and drink only when you're thirsty. Use food to treat first before herbs. So don't automatically go to herbs. See if there's certain things food can take care of. Use animal thyroid glands to treat goiter problems. It's a genius because animal thyroid has some thyroxine and that can be used to treat the thyro- thyroxine deficiency conditions in human. Use animal liver for nine blindness. That's a vitamin A treatment. Use uh, soy, azuki beans, and black beans for gout, for example. So he's got some very useful things in food and both herbal medicine for diseases. And then he talked about cultivating midlife. To him, midlife is 50 and above. Um, And of course, uh, this is something that um, uh, wonderful because this is when you are able to cultivate and strengthen and do things in your midlife that's helpful, you can live a longer period of time and you can prevent the illnesses. The first thing is uh, to make sure that you don't overconsume your young energy. Second, you should prevent that consumption of young energy by making sure you don't get sick often by the six pathogen and seven emotions. Do not force things. By this point, you understand there are certain things you can force, but there are certain things you just have to let it be. And careful with excessive tastes. Don't always go for strong taste. Go for a more balanced taste. Not too salty, not too sweet, not too sour, for example. Maintain not full, not empty, not warm, and not cold. So what that means is always give yourself a little room. When you eat a meal, make sure you have a little room left. Okay? When you have certain warmth, make sure you actually have a little cold so that you're not always too warm. So it motivates your young energy, motivate your energy. Okay? Um, Encourage the use of cow milk. He actually is not against dairy. He believes dairy product can actually be nourishing if you use properly. Don't overdo it. He encouraged food treatment first before medicine usage. And he believed in monitoring emotions for depression. This is probably the first place besides the one day aging discuss about the importance of watching emotions, especially in depression. So in summary, <clears throat> Taoist medicine evolved from religious healing to medicine focused on longevity, disease prevention, nutrition, and cultivation of characters. Contribution to TCM is enormous, and especially in the area of food therapy, healthy aging, and chronic illnesses. So what is the modern-day Taoist physician looks like? Well, this is someone who practiced TCM with a strong focus on prevention and longevity who is an avid practitioner of Tai Chi Chen, martial arts, Qigong, or other exercise and meditative practices, have interests and understand in the practice of Yijing, Feng Shui, and astrology, and Taoist philosophy. He or she understands the ecology of a person's life, and so that he understands how each environment, whether it's a physical environment or emotional environment, or human relationship environment, that's the ecology of the environment that can affect a person's health and life. So you must practice medicine according to that ecology. Take that into consideration. And not the least, Taoist physician believes and practices self-cultivation. He asks the question, what can I contribute to the world? Thank you very much for listening.